welcome back to another episode of Forbidden Depths. I'm your host, Queen Frostbidden, and we're here today to get down, dirty, and sultry by staying open, educated, consensual, and safe. If you're returning, welcome back to another episode. Thanks for supporting the channel and its growth. If, of course, you're new here, make sure you follow, like, and subscribe, because one taste will never be enough. thank you guys back welcome back oh my goodness uh, you can tell i've had the weekend off um welcome back to another episode of forbidden depths today we have an amazing individual i actually found on tiktok so i'm gonna let her introduce herself hey i'm moriana hey everyone thank you thank you now if you want to follow on tiktok um there's all kinds of okay so the reason I started following you was the educational and the information that you provide so I want to start out by asking you what made you get started on that kick like what inspired you well really I've always been interested in helping others out in relation to kind of the xxsx industry and whatnot um, I've been in and out of it since I was 18, 19 years old, doing a wide variety of things. And unfortunately, Stripper Webs, which was a fantastic resource for newbies and veterans, went down in February 2023. So it kind of left this void of people wanting to be educated, but right. they didn't really have the resource. So I felt like, well, I'll see what I can do with the TikTok sensors, try to, to get yeah. clever and work around it and see what I can do to help others out in that regard <laughs> right yeah because i mean like all the other platforms there's there's a huge censorship and it's like some stuff they allow which doesn't make any sense and then other stuff like if you just say sex on there they're like yeah no mm -mm, there's a problem mm -hmm. and i'm just like why would you not want everyone to be more educated but that all goes back to i i feel like they don't want the masses educated that's just me <laughs> So that's kind of why I started um, my YouTube channel too, because I want to educate people. I'm tired of so many people being like, I don't know how to get into anything. I don't, I don't know what to do. You find guys that are like, I don't, I don't know where this is on a woman or on, even on themselves. They're like, where do I find that on myself? And I'm like, are we for real right now? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I felt like we kind of had a similar mission. <laughs> mm -hmm so um kind of tell me I know that you have a lot of interests of your own kind of tell me uh what your interests are starting out um like your attractions kind of um your focuses whenever you're doing play because I know you also do play right mm -hmm. yep so tell me about it. Uh, really what kind of initially got me interested in it was I remember I was a part of the queer club in college and the local BDSM King Group did a, you know, kind of meet and greet with the club when I around when I was age 18, 19. And obviously I'd heard of it before, but it never really caught caught my interest in that kind right. of regard. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then a year or two later, they did it again. And for whatever reason, it was like a light bulb went off. And I'm like, oh, well, I am interested. <laughs> and I started down the rabbit hole, so to speak, of pet play, which naturally interested me because I've always liked animals and that kind of thing. So just the idea of, oh, I get to have fun pretending I'm an animal. Oh, that sounds fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's how that kind of got started and everything else kind of naturally followed with what I, because this was back when Tumblr was cool with rated M blogs. Right. And I would explore, I see what what would catch my eye and Really, I just, I really enjoy just kind of diving full force into the BDSM kink field. And right now, I actually have a partner that's also very much interested in BDSM. So we enjoy exploring it together. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, it happened to be that a lot of our interests kind of overlapped with each other. We have similar right. units, interests, whatever. So we kind of fit together very nicely in that regard. And right. 
it's very nice to actually have a partner that's actually supportive of that and willing to engage in that kind of thing because otherwise it's like oh this is a little frustrating <laughs> right yes for sure for sure and so whenever you started your relationship with your partner was it one of those things that you were kind of upfront about your kinks your interests or was it something that developed with like between you two over time well, it's actually kind of funny because we met each other about eight years ago on Tumblr. He actually found my BDSM education blog and mm. sent me a message saying, hey, I really like your stuff. I'm like, oh, thank you. And we just kind of casually message each other back and forth. Eventually, that grew to Facebook friends. And then eventually we're like, hey, interested in each other. Want to start dating? Okay. <laughs> and that's how that happened. <laughs> nice. Nice. So it was kind of like you guys got to start out with BDSM. So you kind of knew where you were in the lifestyle in the beginning. So that's really, really awesome. Yeah, that was really a relief to figure that out where it wasn't like this awkward conversation or anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So whenever you started, um, I guess the the educational aspect, was that something that you were interested in before? Or was it when, when everything started shutting down, you were like, oh, well, I need to kind of help make ends meet since there's not the, no other resources out there that I've been able to find for myself. It was something that I've always been interested in. I think one of the biggest obstacles, at least in the beginning, was one, my age, because I was only about really 19, 20 when I really started to learn and get comfortable. But of course, at that age, you're kind of barely in the legal zone in regards to yeah. adult communities. And with that comes a little bit of ageism with the whole oh, well, you've only learned about this for two years. How can you know anything? And it's like, we have the internet. <laughs> yeah. I I have done, I had read so much articles, books, watched interviews, et cetera, just trying to consume as much as I could to ensure the fact that one, I was learning the right info. And two, okay. I was learning how to do things safely because yes. especially when you get more into the rougher, rougher play, even basic kind of rigging, there, it is so easy to do accidental damage, be it permanent or something that ends up and has you end up in the hospital that I did not want to risk that to myself or a partner. Right. So it was really just this matter of I want to help others while also learning about this myself. And naturally, you know, as time went on, Tumblr decided, oh, we're not going to allow this anymore. And then there was that incident with OnlyFans where they wanted to try to pull sex workers from their platform and then later on, uh, stripper webs went offline. So gradually this niche started to grow. The gap just started growing wider and wider to the point where it just kind of further kind of gave me the kick, so to speak, mm -hmm. psychologically speaking, to really try to reach out and help others out in that regard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So um, I noticed in your bio for TikTok that you have several things that kind of describe who you are traditionally like most people do can you tell us what your bio stands for and kind of how everything got incorporated yeah right now it has my age because it's it's so much easier especially on the not safe for work side of twitter tumblr whatever to just be like hey this is how old i am right <laughs> um minors don't interact mostly because i just got tired of dealing with minors on top of the fact that a lot of my content is naturally shifts towards the adults only community right. bdsm kink fetish whatever and right. i don't want minors engaging in that i i just don't right. i understand they're going to be looking this stuff up on their own time but I don't feel comfortable being a part of that, especially with the legality of laws and everything. And I don't want to be right. the victim of a lawsuit because a mom finds out little Jimmy was looking up my stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah so sure. it was more of a means of legally to protect myself in that regard. I've got right. my pronouns because I'm non-binary and I prefer they, them. And then I've got two of my most prominent chronic illnesses, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is EDS, in narcolepsy, I have some other stuff going on, but those are the two most prominent things that kind of affects my daily life. So right. that's why I have that just to be up front of, hey, I got chronic issues. So if I'm not posting as much, I could be having a flare up with that. Right. And just this is how it this is how it influences my daily life, both in and out of the kink community. Yeah. And let me tell you, having a chronic illness makes life complicated by itself, let alone mm -hmm. with 
adding in the dynamics of some kind of kink related, you know, festivities. So whenever you are having your flare ups and stuff, how, how do you deal with that? Um, with your play do you just completely avoid play or do you do lighter play how does that work well my partner his biggest thing within the kink community his biggest interest is rigging bondage that kind of thing and he knows i have eds so with that it's a matter of one being mindful of bruising because i'm more easily prone to bruising so impact play bondage that kind of thing as well as being really careful with how he rigs up my body I like being tied up. He likes tying me up. But at the same time, we have to be very careful to not accidentally throw a joint out of place or mm -hmm. the, along those lines. And he's actually a former state trooper. So he has police okay. grade handcuffs. So he's very aware of safety at the same right. time. Um, if he puts the handcuffs on, say, another play partner, he knows he can he can be a little bit more free with putting them a little bit tighter with me. I can only wear them for a short period of time. Right. And if I want to wear something overnight, I have to use more aesthetic frilly stuff because right. it's not necessarily too constricting because we have to be careful of not leaving indents on my skin, not potentially causing a problem with my nerves, that kind of thing. So right. it's a matter of being more careful at the same time. We try to explore and figure out ways that we still want to do what we want to do, just, you know, kind of find a workaround. Right, right. You're being safe and educated doing it. And I feel like that's neglected a lot because people are like, oh, well, if you have to prep and you have to have all this information, is it really exciting? Yes. <laughs> to play and know what you're doing, it is exciting. <laughs> yeah. Because then you know you're taking care of yourself and whoever you're playing with, right? That's how I look at yeah. it. Like, I'm the safest I can be. I'm taking care of them because I think most people that I've come across people that aren't in the community obviously um they lean more toward abuse being domination and I'm like that's not what domination is at all um if you are a dominant you take care of your submissive period just mm -hmm. like submissive is going to take care of you it is just like a regular relationship there's respect there's taking care of your partner the only thing is you're throwing in some kinky stuff that you both like like it's still a relationship where you take care of someone. Yeah, like my like I know there's safe, sane, consensual, and rack risk risk aware consensual mm -hmm. kink. Personally, I'm not really a fan of either of those with how I play. I prefer P R I C K, which is uh, personal responsibility, individual consensual kink, because it puts the emphasis on you know your own safety and limits and you trust the other person to know their safety and limits and obviously there's the whole make sure you know you two are on the same page right but it puts the emphasis on you're taking responsibility for yourself as well as trusting your partner to take responsibility for themselves and that's why yeah. i prefer that an acronym <laughs> yeah for sure for sure and i don't know i it's one of those situations i feel like um not everyone is as educated as they should be because they're scared to do the research because doing the research means that they don't know already like you can yeah. come in and not know stuff that's fine what's not okay is whenever you pretend like you do and you hurt yourself or someone else because you have this expectation for yourself um kind of like we were talking about a moment ago some people are going to run across your information and maybe they shouldn't be there Maybe it's a, mm -hmm. a minor that shouldn't be there. Well, they're doing some kind of research, whatever they're doing. Uh, adults can do the same thing. They can do research. Like as an adult, you should want all the information that you can have to make sure that you and your partner are safe. And I mean, to really know who you are, because I met someone a while back. I have a kink group on um, Facebook that I started up a while back and they were asking, what am I basically? So... Mm -hmm. He gave a, like, a wide list of things. And he's like, so what does this mean that I am? One, I was like, why does nobody use Google to do a search for one? <laughs> two, yeah. two um, I explained that it could be a voyeur or he could be exhibitionist, depending on kind of how you looked at it, the environment, what is going on, because so many people get those confused. And there was this other person that was like, oh, no, you're definitely an exhibitionist looking for a voyeur. And I'm like, well, that's not necessarily true. Like, it 
depending on what's going on in the situation, who's involved, what's happening. Like there's a lot of different things that's going on there because some of that's blended, right? Well, yeah, it's kind of similar. It's kind of similar to the whole, there's the condylism fetish and people are like, what's that? I'm like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) It's not a very well-known idea, but it's kind of like a similar combination between voyeur, exhibitionist, and a little bit of cucking, Mm -hmm. but it's kind of a unique spin on the three. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those, oh, well, you shouldn't talk about it because those are one of the ones that's shamed. That's one of the kinks that's Mm -hmm. shamed. Like, I enjoy cooks. I'm going to tell you, I enjoy a good cook. Like Mm -hmm. I have a thing for cooks and everybody, especially in Kentucky, I'm from Kentucky. Everybody in Kentucky is all like, oh, well, you're a cook. And they see it as a derogatory term. And I'm like, obviously you're not educated. Mm -hmm. Anyone in the industry, if there's any cooking going on, it's always a respectful environment. It's always everybody getting their needs fulfilled. It's not somebody being like, oh, I'm going to take your woman. Yeah. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) So, again, I feel like it's a lot of people not being educated and they just traditionally assume something is derogatory and then they don't get educated because they're like, oh, well, that's bad. We, we We don't need to do that. Yeah, unfortunately, that's kind of unfortunately that's kind of big in the pet play and little community because people immediately think, oh, zoophilia or beefilia, yeah. which is like, no, yeah, no. no, that's not what that means at all. <laughs> that's not. What, and oh my goodness, I remember somebody asking me that actually. They were like, uh, "Do you offer this?" I can't remember what they said, but I was like, "No," but I offer pet play, and they were like, "Oh, what is that?" And I'm like okay let me explain it to you and they're like oh so you're you're not over here you know engaging with animals and I'm like no I'm not (laughs) no that's not me if that's your Um, I'm not shaming it but listen that is not for me mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah it's kind of like how fet life they keep adding new titles you can put on your profile and I noticed they added stag and vixen which as you know is from the cooking community And I'm like, the poor fox players who don't understand that. And it's like, oh, Vixen, I'm a girl fox player. Not like that. Not like that. (laughs) I'm like, yeah. (laughs) And see, that's that's one of those things, though, that kind of people don't realize, hey, it can be used interchangeably. So, yeah, maybe people in pet play get that confused. One, because people are undereducated. And two, because they feel like, if they do education, like if they're trying to focus on something, it's like, oh, well, I didn't know that already. And they feel shame. Never feel shame for researching something. If you don't know, research mm-hmm. it. I've been a pro dom for 10 years. And I'm going to tell you that there are still times when I have to research because I don't know something. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. I would rather do research to know for sure than like jump in and assume that I know something. And then it just be completely wrong because that's a bad environment for everyone involved, you know? Yeah. And especially when we look at like the popular media, especially within the last five, 10 years, I've tried to depict it, especially with Netflix. Netflix has kind of been touch and go with their, what they expose. Like there's the show Bondage. Well, there's some questionable stuff on that with the pro-dom psychology student girl and the clueless assistant she hires and then I haven't haven't seen it there's another show called uh I think it's just called like sex life and it's about this girl where she fantasizes about her ex-boyfriend and her husband finds the diary and he tries to go on this wild sex adventure with her and he really is doing it because he doesn't like her ex-boyfriend and Mm. it gets complicated and consent kind of goes out the window like the neighbors take this couple unknowingly to a sex party without giving them the heads up. And I'm like, why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, that's a recipe for wow. desi- uh, like disaster, like all together. And, you know, that is one of the biggest things I have noticed that any kind of civilian looking at the community thinks that once you step into that you're giving up consent completely Mm -hmm. you know how disgusting it is for me to talk to someone and they're like 
oh, well, you just like beat the shit out of people, whether they want you to or not. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. Well, it's like I have my business account on FetLife for my mommy dom erotic audios. All the time I get clueless submissive men that are like please be my mommy and i'm just like pay me and then they try to turn it on me saying oh you're destroying the sanctity of this dynamic and i'm like you clearly see uh, this is a business profile there's no way to miss it <laughs> yeah well and that's something that i ran into as well there were several people that contacted me and they're like oh well i need a play partner and i'm like well if you're looking for an amateur play partner, then that's what you need to look for. Mm -hmm. Someone, someone that just wants to play. I was like, you don't come to a professional being like, oh, well, I expect all of your service and knowledge for free. What? It doesn't work like that, no. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, there are people that go to parties strictly to play. But if you are looking for a professional, don't expect professional time for free. That's like, you know, going to a department store and seeing this name brand hanging on a rack and being like, I know you took years to build up your brand and make people want your brand to make it desirable, but I expect it free. Yeah. That's not how it works. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did fin dom for about a year, so I get it. <laughs> so I didn't know that. Tell me about your experience. <laughs> oh, I think, oh, I got some pretty wild uh, requests during that time. And I actually found out, you know, my current partner, my boyfriend, he knew I was a fin dom and he seriously considered hiring me to okay. be his dom. But because of money troubles, he ultimately backed out. But, you know, he didn't tell me about that until we started dating. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you um, need but, to pay rent, sir. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> do do? And, um, I got some pretty wild requests. One of them was one sub wanted me to um, obviously me get paid, but he wanted to trim his toenails, put it in a glass, and then send it to me and watch me smell it. Yeah. I, another one wanted me to cut my hair and send it off to him and obviously he's paying me and then watch me watch him eat my hair hmm i can't i can't <laughs> say i've had any i've had the no i've had the nail clippings but i've never had the let me eat your hair now i have had let me um pull with your hair so <laughs> they wanted me to shave my hair and they wanted to use it for their own purposes so <laughs> Oof. <laughs> but I haven't had anyone to eat my hair that I know of. <laughs> so that's a new one for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wild world out there, right? And like that's what people don't understand. There are so many, so many different things that you can get into. Getting into BDSM, uh, whether we're talking about FinDom or FemDom or whatever else. There are so many different little niches that you can get into. You don't have to be like, oh, well, this person is doing this and it looks like it makes money or it looks like um, it's something I could be interested in because they're doing it. Like find yourself, experiment with yourself. You know what I mean? I, I full heartedly agree with that. And frankly, I really dislike the trends that are going on within the FinDom community on Twitter, especially now because I'll just see a girl with generic lingerie tits ass pussy pictures or generic feet pictures and they're like pay me like a loud car salesman and i'm like you're not doing anything to distinguish yourself you're not you're just yeah. screaming and i'm all just like this is not Have how you this heard of works. vanilla dom mm -hmm. i'm gonna tell you it blew my mind whenever i heard that there was a vanilla dom and there was that one fin dom chick that made it look like she bullied a submissive off of Twitter to the point where he considered self-harm. And of course the community turned on her and she was like, oh no, this was all, you know, play pretend. And I'm like, even if that's so, you don't put that on a public platform. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. Like, <clears throat> again, that goes, that feeds back into people thinking that abuse and BDSM are the same thing. And they're not. Mm -hmm. They're not. Mm -hmm. 
because even the heavy, heavy impact play or heavy humiliation, all of that still has pre and post care. There's yep. still care that evolves all the way around that. It's not one of those things that you just go into a room and you just beat the shit out of somebody and leave them laying in the floor and leave. That's fucking abuse. Mm-hmm. Like that's abuse. Now I don't know if pink.com still does it, but I know there was a time again, I don't know if they still do it, where they showed the aftercare scene yes. where they showed their actors actually caring for each other. Yep. Yep, they did. Um actually I had uh Sophia Locke. Do you know Sophia Locke? Yeah, I've seen her. Um, she was on the show and she was kind of explaining about the aftercare because she was heavy, heavy into kink. She's still heavy into kink. She does more like vanilla stuff now, um, with like the mommy kind of stuff. And she just recently did some mommy dom stuff, but she's mostly submissive. Um, so heavy impact play, like heavy, heavy scenes. And, um, several of hers, she was explaining, yeah, they, had us all sit down and talk to each other and talk it out in the beginning, you know, kind of where we are, where we want to go, what we're interested in. And then afterward, we would do the same thing. Everybody would be like, okay, how do you feel? Where are you? Is everything okay? Mm -hmm. Mentally, physically, like that's the part you don't get to see because they did that stuff before. They just didn't film it. Right. And then whenever all the shit blew up with Pornhub, they're like, oh, well, we need to show people that this is what we do that this is okay and they started including that and i was like fuck yeah fuck yeah did you watch the thing on netflix for pornhub i've seen i'm i know i've seen life after pornhub and i've seen a few other documentaries that kind of dove into it both pro and against it just to get the full try to get the full spectrum of ideas of people with that. what did you think about it i need to know um i feel like unfortunately given how massive a scale that company is obviously there's going to be controversy that follows it unfortunately for myself people have asked me you know why don't you put your audios on that site and i'm like i don't feel comfortable considering the history of the website there has been so many lawsuits both current and those who have been dismissed or they settled that involved actual minor child pornography on the website. And the only reason they took it down was because the lawsuit started piling up. And I'm like, any sensible, ethical website, the moment they found out, they should have taken it down. But no, they didn't because they were getting monetization off of it. And because of that, even though they were harming minors, they didn't. And for me, that's just a huge no, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So the biggest, okay, so the biggest issue they had was the ones that really had the minors in it the illegal ones um they didn't have them monetized so they didn't pay that much attention to them that was the issue Mm -hmm. the people that put them up put them up strictly to have their um sadistic needs fixed Mm -hmm. with that just that alone um was helping their needs so they could still you know experience their power every time they went back to watch this shit and it wasn't monetized, so they didn't pay as much attention. They're like, oh, well, that's just some, they're not making any money, so why do we really want them there? Or they don't They don't really want to be here. It's just something they did mm-hmm. on their, you know, their pastime. No, those people were looking for a form of power. They were trying to relive it. And then they wanted to share it with others that are like them. So they wanted mm-hmm. to share that shit, right? Well, they didn't do it because they wanted money from it. Those people are just, I mean, they're just shit people. They wanted to do that because that satisfied their needs and people like them. It had nothing to do with, oh, let me make some money off of it, which is one reason the website was just like, well, the people that were in charge of the website were like, oh, well, don't worry about that. It'll go away. Don't worry about that. That's not going to go the fuck away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So they had been told several times, hey, this is on your website. And they were just like, oh, well, it's not significant enough for us to do anything about it until it was significant enough for them to do yeah. something about it. But by yeah. that time, it are, look how many people it harmed. Look how many people it hurt. Look how many kids, teenagers that were taken advantage of. And it all goes back to people at the top not doing their job. And it's then, similar. Yeah, it's 
Oh, I was going to say, it's similar to the whole fact that it's a moderation problem that Facebook also has. They don't yes. have a large enough moderation team to actually thoroughly go through these videos and ensure, one, it's not actual minors, victims of actual sex mm -hmm. trafficking, etc. Mm -hmm. On top of, is it actual non-consent? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Pornhub only had a handful of people doing the evaluations for all of the clips. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they're going to skip through some of it because, I mean, whenever you only have five, ten people and you have millions of videos that you have to look through, that's mm -hmm. that's, yep. like, that's the definition of overworked and underpaid. Yep. Like, no one can do it. And no successful company, especially in that niche, should be doing anything like that because... Oh, yeah. It was one of those things where uh, Pornhub is very, very wide open. Like, there's a lot of shit there. Like, it's not just strictly vanilla. It's not just strictly kink. Like, you can find all kinds of shit. There's even shit there where people literally don't do anything sexual. There's one oh, guy. Yeah. One guy. <laughs> you could watch movies with him. <laughs> yeah, right. So, like, there's just... I feel like they should have paid more attention a long ass time ago and it would have, because it made it horrid for actual creators on the platform. Yeah. Um, whenever I was there, that was one of my primary sources of income. Right. Mm -hmm. And then whenever they were like, oh, well, we're taking all monetizations off. So they took down their clip stores. They took down a lot of videos, like my humiliation shit. They took that down. And I was like, I'm literally looking at the camera talking shit to it. Like, I'm not hurting anyone, but you let these people that did hurt people stay up. It didn't make any sense to me. Anyway, it's like, with all of that range, you need someone that can go in and look at all of that and determine, is this consent? Is this not consent? Like you mm -hmm. were talking about, there's just not enough fucking eyes. There's not enough... It it's similar to how Fet Life started to come down on sex workers, hypnosis play, consensual yeah. blackmail, etc. Yeah. And it was really frustrating because the biggest issue with hypnosis specifically was people were going off the misconceptions of it makes people do stuff they don't want to do. Well, mm -hmm. no, no amount of hypnosis is not going to trick a brain into suddenly, I don't know, wanting to be tied up. That's not how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think part of that is because lack of education. Again, mm -hmm. people don't understand what it actually is, you know? And whenever people don't understand what it actually is, instead of being like, let me educate myself, they're like, oh, well, let's not talk about that. Let's push it under the rug. Let's, yep. let's shun it, you know? Yep. And I'm one of those people. I'm like, no, I have to know. <laughs> I want <Yeah>. to know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's one of those I feel a lot of people are just not educated enough, which is another reason why we're here. It's why we're here today. Yep. yep. <laughs> so tell me kind of about um, some kink that changed your perception. So it's something that you, maybe you didn't really know about. And then after you learned about it, you're like, hmm. I think, honestly, one of the biggest things in that regard would be electrical play because mm -hmm. electrical play can absolutely be intense, but say with like some people will use industrial ten un TENS units that are made for like chiropractors, and then others can just be a little zap, like the violet wand where you just kind of run it over someone's skin and you see that really cool crinkly effect. And I saw... Like, I always knew it could be artistic before, but that kind of really made me see the full broad spectrum of things in that regard. You can use it just for sensation. You mm -hmm. can do it just because you like that tingly sensation. And sometimes you just like the colors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, it really had me really see, oh, there's, you can use this for so much besides, you know, first in impressions or anything like that and like I like like I have a regular tens unit I use it for pain relief so right. 
uh it's fun for that but it's also like if we want to be doing kinky stuff we can be doing kinky stuff with it <laughs> yeah yeah for sure and uh, it's another one of those things like um anyone listening that doesn't know about uh, electrical play we're not talking about like strapping someone to a chair with like a battery <laughs> and you know no <laughs> we're not we're not talking about like putting someone and like frying them <laughs> yeah um so there's a lot of different kinds of electro play too. There's just so many things that you can kind of incorporate. Like yours, it's a medicinal that mm -hmm. can also be used for play, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of household items you can use for play. And um, of course, for your regular household stuff and use them for play too. And mm -hmm. people don't realize that. Like I remember I was uh, mentoring a, a guy on uh, Chatterbait. And he's like, well, what should I use? Um, I don't really have anything really kinky around the house because, you know, I live with my parents. And I'm like, you can make anything kinky. <laughs> I was like, you have a hairbrush. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we've got a hairbrush. We, we can we can start here. <laughs> hairbrush and ice. It's, it's <laughs> funny because, you know, I follow a lot of other not safe for work voice actors on Twitter. And I jokingly say we're all friendly and horny all the time. And we're constantly giving each other advice. And mm -hmm. someone was like, how can I give realistic blowjob sounds? And I'm like, do you have a plastic Coke bottle? Yeah. You know, those little grooves on the side. Yeah. Lick it. It sounds like a blowjob. They're like, <gasps> <laughs> so we're always just telling each other shit like that, just to help each other out and just give each other clever ideas to like simulate sound effects and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's an art, right? Mm -hmm. That's how I see it too. I see it as art. And I mean, I fucking love, love what I do. And that's why I don't let anyone come in and like mess up the flow that I have with work because I'm not letting someone taint something that's so important to me, something that gives me so much positive energy, so much satisfaction, because I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you whenever I found BDSM, it truly helped me like overall, it helped me mentally, physically. It was one of those things that was like, yeah, I should have been doing this years ago, but again, mm -hmm. I was from Kentucky and there were taboos. So the stuff you did, you had to do like in private, like behind doors. Yeah. And um, that could become very unsafe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy to see how healing and liberating BDSM fetish and kink can be with a consensual partner with everything. Because like I, I came from a very abusive background between romantic partners, etc., and when I kind of stumbled into it, I really found I was able to re-explore and kind of re-identify myself with what yeah. I liked, what I disliked, and kind of found my own rhythm with that kind of thing. Right. Because overall, it's therapy. I look at it mm -hmm. as, as therapy. Because even if you had some kind of um, terrible, like, a abusive situation, you can literally learn to have some kind of play that identifies with that that helps you through those moments because I have mm -hmm. PTSD and there are certain things that I do during play that helps me with my PTSD and over the years I'm gonna fucking tell you it has helped me more than any therapist more than any doctor could ever help me and mm -hmm. one it's because it is a safe consensual environment Two, the people I play with want to be there. They want to satisfy my needs. They want to mm -hmm. be helpful. Um, they want to be open because you shouldn't be engaging any kind of play with someone that doesn't want the best for you anyway. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I think that's where a lot of people, they're like, oh, well, I really want to do that, do this. And this is the only opportunity I'll get. It doesn't matter who it's with. It does matter who it's with. Mm-hmm. Because you can take and make a negative or positive association. It could cause you to not want kink or BDSM for the rest of your life if you have a terrible experience. Mm -hmm. So tell me what your safety measures look like whenever you are playing with a partner. Generally speaking, we use the traffic light system just because we both have ADHD. So thinking of a word like it's that joke where you're like, you can't remember the safe word, so you start screaming random words. <laughs> so we normally go with the traffic light system where, you know, green, keep going, yellow, slow down, but keep going, red, stop, stop, stop. 
Um, but my partner, who is my boyfriend, is very careful with that anyway, because he'll pause regardless of what we're doing, just to be like, hey, you still with me? Just to ensure, you know, I'm not so deep into, in this case, subspace that I'm not considered safe to play with anymore. Right. Um, like when me and him were playing, because we're both switches, he was in a subspace and I was playing with him and I noticed his sub side was starting to get more into almost a frenzy. And I was like, whoa, pump the brakes there, kiddo. <laughs> right. I didn't want him to potentially put him himself at risk for harm when he was in that kind of headspace. So right. I had to step up and be the responsible one and be like, okay, we'll, we'll take it slow. Maybe we'll do that another time. But right now, let's kind of creep into it. So that way I can ensure, you know, one, you're not pushing yourself too hard and two, you can physically handle it because regardless if it's any kind of bondage impact insertable whatever it is you're doing if you suddenly are jumping from step a to step d well then there might some something might go wrong <laughs> yes yes especially oh my goodness so anybody that hasn't experienced subspace or does not understand it whenever you do get into subspace it's one of those things where it's like the desire takes over kind of like an intoxication right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you're not in your sound, sane mind sometimes if you're so deep in subspace. So your dominant, you have to trust them and they really have to care for you in that sense. That all goes back to like we were mm -hmm. talking about earlier, you care for your partner because they're trusting you. You have to put your trust in them. So mm -hmm. it's an energy exchange. And yep. you need to be conscious, especially if you're doming someone, you need to be conscious of that because sometimes they could ask for things that press their limits and then later feel like they were violated. Yep. And that's scary territory. That's why you got to tread lightly, just like she was talking about. So I have a question for you, Vi. I, I'm so curious because I, ha I was having this discussion with someone a few days ago and I was talking to them about worship. So the person I was talking to was like, well, can a dominant um, really worship a submissive? And I want to hear your side. I feel like they can. It's more when I when I hear and think the word worship from a dominant perspective, I think of just in this case with a submissive, just seeing them as kind of like the ultimate light in a dark tunnel. You love them. You adore them. You want to keep them safe. And ways to show that could be body worship, where you're just kind of lightly caressing them, you're kissing them, just, you know, telling them, you know, you are the person for me. And now kink and romant being romantic don't have to intertwine with each other, but a lot of the time, just given what we are doing, the intensity of the situation, on top of the brain biochemical cocktail going on in your head that's encouraging the bonding, the happy, the loving feelings, it's very, very common to have some kind of feeling develop, be it right. platonic, romantic, sensual, whatever. Now, for me, me and my partner are dating each other. We're both polyamorous, so he might play with someone else, but at the same time, he always comes back to me at the end of the day. Right. So that's the comforting aspect, and I love seeing the sweet, the sweet romantic messages he sends me i love seeing the more kinky messages he sends me because i swear to god i jokingly say he makes it his mission sometimes to see how heavy he can make me blush in the middle of a work day by sending me a very kinky message and i'm like <gasps> and so sweat who am i flush do i look red <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i love it i love it so yeah, I absolutely believe a dominant can show worship and just complete adoration for their sub. Me too. <laughs> so I was having a debate and someone was like, uh, no, dominants don't do that. And I was like, well, do you care for your sub? Mm -hmm. Because if you care for them, then yes, you can most definitely worship them. It's like anything else. It's like... um if your sub is wearing say heels or something and their shoe comes undone and you lean over to button it, that is you showing that you care for your sub. Mm -hmm. That's a form of worship for me being like, Hey, let me help take care of you. Um, and in those, the body worship situations is the same thing. You don't have to be a submissive to worship, but it's so common. It's like people get it twisted in their head. They're like, 
well, um, you're only supposed to worship if you're the submissive because it shows that you're beneath the other person. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. where'd you get this information? Yeah. Because if you care for your submissive, well, I mean, in reality, it doesn't matter which role you're playing. If you care for your partner, you're going to do things that make them more comfortable, more confident, more open to playing with you and showing signs of appreciation. Yep. And some people that's even in their love language. So you could literally be meeting part of someone's love language just by doing some kind of worship or appreciation. And for me, mm-hmm. that's in the relationship period. Like if you care for someone and I mean, you don't have to do body worship to show that you care, but you have to show some kind of appreciation because if you're not showing that you have appreciation for them, then it can lean over more toward the abusive side. That's when you stop doing the aftercare. That's when you stop paying attention to their needs. And listen, submissive have needs just like the dominant does. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about that? I would definitely agree with that. And I've never really liked the whole common phrase you sometimes see in BDSM groups where they're like, the submissive has all the power. And I'm like, no, actually, it's an equal exchange of power because the submissive is agreeing to put their safety in the dominant hand and the dominant is agreeing to have the submissive try to work with whatever they like or dislike. And it's it's a negotiation of, what can I do to help my needs be met and your needs be met while also being mindful of potential limitations? Yes, I love that. I always use it. Um, my phrase is power exchange. There's an exchange mm-hmm. of power that you share. So yep. that power isn't solely one or the other person's. It's a power that you share. Yes, the submissive has control in a sense because I mean, Without their submission, there's no play anyway, right? Mm -hmm. But the power has to be exchanged back and forth and used in order for anyone to do their job, to do anything during play to begin with. So for me, I see it as an exchange. That's where my head goes. We'll give it, we'll give her a second. Sorry about that. One of my friends trying to come in. So I told them I'm on the call. (laughs) That's okay. That's okay. So tell me about how long you have been practicing, um, not just, I guess, kink, but BDSM as a whole. Oh, about 10 years. So what's your perception look like when you started and now? When I started, um, it was definitely more of trying to figure out where I fit in with the buffet, Mm -hmm. so to speak. And now it's more of a, I have a lot of education experience under my belt, not necessarily a lot of in-person play perspective, going to munches and whatnot, just because I had not been given that opportunity before, very much before until relatively recently. So now it's a matter of I want to try to help out the newbies kind of figure out their grounds. And especially if you're interested in sex work, one, I want to make sure you know exactly what you're getting into and not the romanticized bullshit on social media. It's a lot of work. Yeah. (laughs) And just helping them figure out what they're comfortable with, what they're not, letting them know you can say no and walk away at any time. Yes. Yes. 100%. So with your perception now that you have with all the time and um, the energy, just all of the practice under your belt, um, what do you feel it takes to be successful in BDSM? A willingness to learn is the number one thing and no there's always going to be something out there that you don't understand there might be an abbreviation you're not familiar with and just be willing to actually talk to people because there's always going to be someone who's smarter than you in a specific field there's always going to be someone who doesn't quite understand what you're trying to communicate with them be it your own play partner a munch group whatever so you can actually you know be engaged and Mm -hmm. actually get what's in your head out there into the world because 
the online community is completely different from in person on top mm -hmm. of the fact the online community is almost a sanitized version of what it's actually like when you're actually playing with people. And I feel that a lot of the online community does stuff that doesn't necessarily translate over to reality well. A lot of it is mm -hmm. like extreme fantasy stuff that you're like in person is like, uh, no, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I had to kind of be conscious of. Because I went, I was kind of opposite. I went from in person to online. So I was just like, and a lot of people, a lot of subs stopped talking to me because they were like, um, I want this and this and this and this. And I was like, you know, that can't happen in real life. Right. And they're mm -hmm. like, um, yes, it can. And I'm like, have you ever been in that situation? No. Mm -hmm. I didn't think so. I'm trying to let you know that your fantasy can't translate to reality, especially not in like a, um, I'll give you an example. There was this one submissive that I was talking to that never had an uh, in real life situation. And he was talking to me about scat play. And he's like, um, so I want you to like pinch it off in little pebbles. And I'm like, do you know how the human body works? There's no pinching of the pebbles. <laughs> and um, I'm not trying to make myself like constipated to attend to your pebbles. Yeah. Not, not going to happen. So he's like, yeah. oh, you take everything so literal. And I'm like, you were the one that approached me. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's kind of like the whole, well, why don't you do consensual blackmail? Because the fact of the matter is, even if you put on every single thing, a little disclaimer saying, you know, this is pretend fantasy. If somebody gets cold feet and decides to go to a police officer or a spouse yeah. finds out and takes it to the police officer, you are screwed. <laughs> yep. yep. Anybody that plays like that, I make sure one, they are a long term submissive. They have to be with me for a long time Two. I get paid up front. Yep. You never get paid afterward with that because you will never get paid. Yep. Paid up front. <laughs> Always. Yep. <laughs> so um, I know that you and your partner are both poly. Tell me what life for you as a poly looks like. Well, right now we're currently in a poly V relationship with him being the point in the V where I am his girlfriend and he has an additional girlfriend. I've been dating him for about a year and a few months. He's been dating her for, I think, closer to six, eight years, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. Now, we've known each other for a very long time. It's just due to my own life circumstances. We didn't actually start dating until, you know, a year and a few months. So... We're currently long distance, but I'm actually going to be moving up to be under the same roof as him within before the week's done. Oh, so, nice. yeah, we'll be able to integrate and actually, you know, be one step closer because we've known for a long time uh, that I want to be under the same roof. It's just, again, due to life circumstances, I couldn't have that happen until now. So that's how that works. And it's funny because she is bisexual. And I'm also multisexual. So we're both interested in girls and guys. She has a handful of boyfriends right now. And for me, I only have my boyfriend. I have a long distance girlfriend, but like I love her, but she also ha deals with a lot of life issues right now. So I'm kind of leave it as if you need me, the door is open, but otherwise I get it. <laughs> right, right. So that's how that works out right now. And with how our power exchange dynamic works with our BDSM right now, we have it set where right now I only have one boyfriend who is him. I can have girlfriends, but right now, given I just have a variety of traumatic abuses involving men in my past, so I'm not really interested in pursuing other men right now um right now it's only i can be your boyfriend are you okay with that yes <laughs> yeah yeah and that's one of those things too um okay so a lot of people especially in like um 
Kentucky or I guess more Southern states that I have found, they think that it's polygamy. That's the best way I can. They think that being poly means you are a polygamist. And I'm like, polygamy is a religion. Okay. You're literally like, that's not what you're trying to say. You're trying to say poly, but um, they think that only men can be poly. I'm curious to know what you think about that. I think both anyone has the potential to be polyamorous. And when you right. actually look at the science behind it, it's really interesting because they've really tried to get it down to a science of what ma- makes someone more mon- into monogamy versus polyamory. Mm-hmm. And effectively, it comes down to genetics and what you're exposed to when you're young. Some people are just more inclined to want open relationships. Others are more like, no, I only want my one person. And I'm like, hey, whatever floats your boat is fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I've noticed with the rise I guess kind of more the die out of the old dinosaurs. I guess that's, so I've noticed more with um, our generations coming up that we are more accepting, more open to people being in open relationships or poly relationships, anything non-monogamous. So Mm -hmm. I've quite noticed that a lot of people are more open to the suggestion, even if they're not themselves, they're like, oh, well, if that's what, if that's what interests you, then I'm all for it. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm glad that it's becoming that way. So I guess my question, uh, for you would about poly being polyam is, um, I'm, I'm polyam too. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm a community poly though. Um, so mine isn't, I don't do any kind of, I guess, solo kind of relationships. I like all of my relationship partners to be, um, in some kind of relationship not like sexual it can be completely platonic it can be friendships Mm -hmm. but as a community poly i i expect them to have a good working relationship because i don't hide anything from my partners right yeah so um kind of how do you feel about that do you feel that it should be like um a dynamic where you don't share everything or should you have only certain things between certain partners well, I feel like at the end of the, yeah, I feel like at the end of the day, regardless of who it is, you are always going to have a secret in your closet. That's just right. the reality. People lie, period. People want to keep secrets. And from my perspective, if I'm in a relationship with you, I understand and respect the fact that not everything is going to be completely open. However, if it's something important that could potentially affect our dynamic, say, just jump into the obvious one if you have some kind of infectious disease that could get me hurt if you have some kind of issue going on that suddenly throws my finances out of whack or is somehow going to influence my time of day I want to know about it so if you are like say oh we want to have a dinner date or just do something together and then suddenly you know you have something else come up okay cool let me know so I know how I can adjust my plans. If right. you want to engage in some kind of sexual activity with me, but you're hiding some disease that could potentially harm me in the process, I want to know about that right. because I want to play safe and I want to be mindful. I don't care, say, jumping to an extreme example, I don't care if you have HIV. I just want to know that you are in the undetectable status because otherwise I don't want to put potentially my health at risk for that. Yes, 100%. 100%. So um, with that being said, it leads me to my next question. This is something that so many people have an issue with and I have to explain to them I know that you're not I'm talking about people that are listening Mm -hmm. you don't have to be ashamed let me just say that up front you don't have to be ashamed so how do you feel about regular testing um even if you're in a monogamous relationship like it doesn't have to be a poly relationship how do you feel about regular testing I feel like it should absolutely be more accessible regardless of your socioeconomic background, whatever it is you come from. Um, Generally speaking, the rule of thumb is if you have a new partner, get yourself tested. Otherwise, I think the recommendation currently 
if you have multiple partners period is three to six months, which yeah. I think is a good time frame. Um, generally speaking, um, like whenever I go in for my own regular annual care, OBGYN, et cetera, I'll be like, hey, can you run the panel just to be on the safe side? And of course, they'll tell me yes or no. Um, obviously, if something feels wrong in that regard, whatever it is your gear is between your legs, please check that out so you can be aware because what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of symptoms, regardless of what it is, herpes, HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, et cetera, they don't show symptoms until they're in the oh shit stage. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. that's why I always tell people if something feels funny, get tested because especially with something, say HIV, a lot of early symptoms are similar to the flu. So you might not, not, might not necessarily make the connection. Right. Yes. 100%. I completely agree. Now, of course, if you are doing some kind of sex work regularly and you have contact, you should definitely do it more than three to six months. That's yeah. if you're in just like a, a relationship where you're only exposed to one or a couple partners. Now, the more partners you're exposed to and they're exposed to, the more often you should get tested just because of the overexposure. So there's a lot of factors there. But if there are regular interchangeable partners, then yes, more frequent. But if it's only like two partners and those are the only two regularly, then yeah, um, the recommendation is cool. But keep an eye on that shit because your sexual health and your sexual well-being can affect all of you your mental status, mm -hmm. it can affect your physical status, especially if you have a chronic illness, right? Mm -hmm. We both know that. Any Anything that um, affects your immune system can affect your chronic illness, and that is a no-go. So we have mm -hmm. to be hyper aware. Okay, yep. so um, whenever you kind of went into offering some online dom services what drew you to offer the services well I think like specifically with my mommy dom audio I saw there was kind of there wasn't a lot in that regard there were more submissive men catering to uh fem doms but not necessarily the opposite and because I saw an opening in that niche I thought oh that's something I can do it's not as big uh on the online spaces and i i have fun doing it be yeah. it the more soft sensual stuff where i'm beating the heck out of someone or right. Right. <laughs> everything and all in between so i filled that space because i saw there wasn't as much attention to it so i thought oh that's what can what can i do to make myself stand out online because there's a million and one voice actors in that regard what can i do to you know solidify my identity online and how can you know i enjoy myself and for me since i am a switch i do enjoy using that as a dom outlet for myself yeah yeah for sure i love it i love it and um i feel like so many people look at it as oh well um I'm only dominant or I'm only submissive and that's not true at all there there are an, an entire generation of people that don't even know what a switch is mm -hmm. do you know how sad that is mm -hmm. like they're doing this play and they claim to be this role and they they don't even know what everything is and I mean I mm -hmm. understand the lack of education especially back prior to the internet but now you can literally, if you just Google something, you know, mm -hmm. you can Google and you don't even have to know what the word is. You can Google a question and it'll tell you. Yep. My, I think my biggest complaint with civilians and with professionals is the lack of knowledge because they assume that everyone already knows everything and they just don't do the research because that means then they don't know the knowledge. Like, uh, and one of my biggest things, even to this day, is the acronyms. So I still have to go search stuff because of all the acronyms. Like, do you do BDDDD? -D -D -D, and then they give a bunch of letters. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Let me go Google it. 
<laughs> and then it's kind of like how, you know, there's the whole issue of mommy dom, MD. Wait, what's that? Yeah, that's very common. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for you to not know all the acronyms, don't feel shame. Don't feel like that is something that's bad. If you really want to know, then do research. Also, there are several places, even if it's an acronym, that you can pull it up, be like, what is this acronym in BDSM? And you Google it and you can find it. Um, now, yep. there may be some that have like several, like the BDSM itself stands for several things, uh -huh. but it's one of those things that at least you have some kind of platform for that education. So you kind of know what direction it's going in. Yep. So tell me what strengths and weaknesses you feel you need to embrace your kink side. I think one of the most important strengths to have would be willingness to adapt and communicate. And I think with weaknesses, you need to be aware of where do you lack in social skills? Are you not clear? Are you not a clear communicator? Is it... Are, do you find it hard to bring up your own limits or nervousness, whatever it could be? I think those are important things to really be aware of for what you can work on because one, it'll make you more comfortable as well as whoever your partner is, mm -hmm. make them more comfortable. So everything is clear on the table. Hey, what are you comfortable with? What are you not like soft and hard limits? What is something you might be willing to try? And then what's something that's absolutely off the table? Yes. Yes. 100%. So, um, I really, really like how you phrased that. And I really, really like how you were talking about the, the weakness because some people see weakness and they see it as, oh, well, that's bad. I should just stay away from that. No, you should embrace it so that you know how to allow growth, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. how I see it. So you can allow growth. And at the end of the day, there's a reason there are teams, right? Some people are good at some things while other people are good at other things. You bring them both together and that's a bomb ass fucking team. You separate them and they're not as strong, but you bring them together, you know, and there's all kinds of possibilities. It's the same way. So if, if you are communicating effectively with whoever your partner is and there's the uh, power exchange and everything is flowing the way it should, the only thing that's going to happen there is growth. Because you're open, mm -hmm. you're communicating, you're allowing that power exchange. So, I mean, overall, growth is going to happen if you let it. It's one of those things. <clears throat> I had a sub that literally would not talk to me. Like we were session, we were, we were filming a scene and they literally would not talk to me. And I was like, are you okay? How are you feeling? And they're like, just do it. And I'm like, no, I need to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, where are you mentally? Because as a sub, you shouldn't just be like, oh, well, I'm only doing this because this person that's doming me likes it. And then maybe you're trying anal and your ass gets fucking ripped from all hell and back. Like, that's not good. You shouldn't just do it then because mm -hmm. that's painful. That leaves mm -hmm. bad energy for one. Two, that can cause trauma for the future because you're like, oh, well, I don't want to do that because it hurts too much. Or I don't want to do that because I felt like I couldn't communicate during or whatever the case may be. If you're putting some, some kind of bad label on it, if it's a bad experience, then it's going to be less likely that you want to do that in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. Have you ever had any experiences like that? Uh, I would say yes. There were times where, um, one of my ex partners would try to think I wasn't really open to the whole idea of fetism to begin with due to my own traumatic histories and whatnot. And because he was a sociopathic controlling piece of shit, he tried to more or less force that on me. And there were times when, you know, I was trying to call a safe word. He ignored it and pushed me through to the point where I got physically sick. And because there were some non-consensual things going on in that regard, I happened to find a video that he took of me non-consensually. 
And then I found, you know, where he posted the video and people were commenting on it, really dehumanizing me, which I was not okay with. And just the way he responded, it made me feel very disgusted and grossed out and even more turned off. Like beforehand, I wasn't really interested in it before, but especially with that experience now, I'm just like, oh, hell no, not with a 10 foot pole. (laughs) Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I hope you found some some healing and something that helps you kind of process and yeah with my current partner he's very mindful of the fact that my ex gave me ptsd from a wide variety of things so he's very careful he's very gentle with kind of guiding me through whatever the trauma it is that caused for me good i'm glad because some people again some people confuse abuse with domination you don't have to be fucking abusing someone to enjoy Mm -hmm. being a dominant And I'm going to tell you, whenever I'm playing and I'm enjoying my submissive, I like when my submissive begs for it because I know they're eager for what I'm giving them. Like, Mm -hmm. please give me that, please. Because that, that makes me want to do whatever I'm doing more because I feel like I'm giving them something that they need. I'm not breaching Mm -hmm. some kind of hard or soft limit that they have. I'm, I'm feeding their desires. I'm feeding what they need at the time. Um, because I'm, I'm huge on consent, huge on consent Mm -hmm. because of some of the traumas that I've had in the past. And I, I know that you're very similar. You have an extreme attention to detail. I've noticed that with the videos (laughs) that I've seen Mm -hmm. of you on your TikTok. And that's one reason why I was so excited to to speak with you about the different topics, because, um, not everyone pays attention to details, especially when it's not something that pertains to their desires, most people can can get attention to detail, but it's only if it fits their agenda. You you do research all around, mm-hmm. right? Like you're a spectrum of education, mm-hmm. and I love that. I love it. Okay, so let's talk about your support group. I know that your current partner um, is supportive in BDSM. Does your mm-hmm. family support BDSM and sex work or are they more or less not interested? My family is very old school. There is a gargantuan age gap between me and my parents. And because of that, I more or less, it's more of a don't ask, don't tell situation where I remember one time I was editing the code on a friend's Tumblr blog that was clearly XXX. Now, there weren't graphic photos or nothing on it, but, you know, if you happen to look for longer than five seconds, you'd see it was clearly XXX content. So, you know, I was in the middle of editing the code on my laptop and I happened to be in my parents' kitchen at the time. And I was sitting, you know, at the table editing the code and my father happened to walk by and he happened to look over at the screen and he's like, you know, that stuff is dangerous, right? And I'm like, I'm I'm just editing the code for a friend. Don't don't worry about it. Me thinking to myself, yeah, don't mind the fact I'm kind of a pain slut. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's kind of a don't ask, don't tell situation with the family right now. <laughs> okay, okay, I understand. I know um, some of the older generation, it's more or less they're not really interested in it. It's that it was beat into them that it's terrible, that mm-hmm. it's uh, a just complete no-go, that if you like that stuff, then there's something wrong with you. And they're yeah. like, anything that you do behind the doors, don't tell anyone about it because you know, those Mm -hmm. type of situations. And, um, I know that's how my grandparents were. And I feel like, um, a lot of people in Kentucky, it still kind of bleeds over because Kentucky is like 10 years behind everywhere else. It's, uh, it's terrible, but, um, I feel like it's one of those traditional traits that just kind of carry over. They're like, Oh, that's abnormal. Let's push that out. We don't want, Mm -hmm. We don't want people looking at you negatively or being shitty to you. And that's one of the reasons they would be shitty to you if you're different. And Uh I'm just like, okay, well, I'm still going to be me. (laughs) But if that's the choice you make. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So um, I know that you were talking about having 
uh, PTSD from your ex-partner, they kind of made it uh, play essentially uh, dangerous for you. Um, mm-hmm. So whenever you were recovering um, from all of that trauma, did you uh, seek any counseling? Did you have anyone that kind of helped you through, um, it, I guess, the after exposure, the healing process? Well, aside from my current partner, it was just being there and being supportive and all that lovely stuff. Um, I getting really bad nightmares chronically. I would be having four or six nightmares a night in the beginning for the first few months. And it got to the point where I was very sleep deprived because, because of it. I was lucky if I got three or four hours of sleep at night and trying to juggle that a job and everything else, it was just like, my mind was ready to break. Yeah, so sure. I, 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 went to a psychiatrist they tried me on a few different nightmare management medicines and we found one for me now after you know trying two or three drugs because it's always the fine tuning yeah um that more or less gets me through most of the night so that definitely helps um i was seeing a therapist for about two or three months now and she's really helped me kind of put things into perspective with you know your ex is no longer in your life. Let's focus on the good things and the fact that your current boyfriend from the sounds of it would never, you know, do those right. horrible things to you. So really it's kind of helping my mind more or less pick up the pieces and recover yeah. with that. that's in my past. I have a great future to look forward to. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm glad you found someone that helps. Um, mm-hmm. I always, I'm always super supportive of, um a therapist when of course they do what they're supposed to do there's been several therapists that I've seen personally that I've been like I don't know how you got your credentials but someone needs to take them from you um but whenever you find a good one hold on because even like BDSM or trauma all of that stuff just kind of not even considered life is stressful altogether so oh yeah even with just life, things that life brings with it, I feel like a therapist is extremely helpful. Mm-hmm. So tell me about um, if you could kind of speak to your younger self that was getting into BDSM, what kind of advice would you give them? Really, I would tell them don't be one don't be afraid to dip your toes into something even if it might be new or scary because you might not you might not realize how much you could potentially like it or heck say hey this is absolutely not for me (laughs) on top of the fact of don't let the people who are trying to accuse you of you're young you don't know anything don't let that get to you because there is a good chance that they are so stubborn in their own shoes that they refuse to learn about the new up-and-coming stuff within the community yeah yeah for sure or they could just be a little narcissistic because they've been doing it so long and they think that they know everything yep i've seen that happen quite a bit and then they're like pushing everyone out because they're like oh well you don't know anything that was the dinosaurs i was talking about yep i'll be happy whenever all the dinosaurs go extinct (laughs) (laughs) so um tell me about kind of how you feel when it comes to the harder kind of kinks um are you open to hard kinks and if so where do you draw the line for me any kind of cnc quote-unquote rape play that's off the table for me because given my own traumatic history it's just not something i'm very comfortable with my partner agrees he's not a fan of the whole cnc scene We do kind of more or less have an interesting compromise that's more of a rough play where consensually we've agreed more or less to free use. But if I drop a safe word, things stop. So that's kind of the in the middle niche, so to speak, between those two hard extremes. Um, In regards to breath play, that is absolutely off the table, having worked in healthcare. I've seen the damage it can do. I've seen how it can very quickly accelerate into permanent brain damage or stroke, heart attack, et cetera. 
And people don't realize how dangerous this is because they read about it all the time online. They see it done in porn, audio porn and literature, and they don't realize how potentially dangerous it really is. And all the time, the BDSM advice subreddit is a dumpster fire of quote unquote, is there a safe way to cut off oxygen from someone? Do you realize the words coming out of your mouth? Good, sir. Yeah. So the closest thing that can be done to that is faux breath play where you just put your hand here, no pressure, and the brain, given it's so deep into the space and scene that you're playing, it will trick itself into thinking, oh, I can't breathe when really it can. So it'll simulate breathlessness. There's also a bone here called the hyoid bone where it's awkward, but if you apply direct horizontal pressure, you can simulate breathlessness while minimizing damage to the surrounding blood tissue, etc. And I think my biggest peeve about that is the whole, there's that infamous anatomy picture from a Tumblr post saying, apply pressure to the blood vessels and it's safer than the windpipe. And I'm like, no, you dumb idiots. (laughs) Just because it's an anatomy picture does not mean it's right because arterial play, as that's called, is just as dangerous, if not more so, than breath play because you're cutting off the oxygen and nutrition, not just the breath. So that's one of my biggest pet peeves of the community in that regard. In regards to like severe impact and bondage, go nuts, but not to the point where it's turning a sickly black, purple, Mm. blue color and getting those very deep pigments because then you're potentially risking permanent damage. And that's why I tell people it's okay to have very rough, very intense kinks, etc., just be mindful of what the human body can realistically withstand. Right. Because you don't want to accidentally kill someone. You don't want to accidentally permanently maim someone. Yeah. Like, oh my goodness. It's one of those things, like, people don't realize that nerve damage is a thing. Mm -hmm. Like, you can give someone nerve damage and they don't understand. Oh, well... You can't see it, so it must not... It is very real. Just because you can't see nerve damage doesn't mean it's not real. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I've seen some very questionable stuff. Like, my partner, who, again, is big into rigging and bondage, whenever we're doing a complicated rigging, he'll constantly ask me while, you know, he's rigging me up, does this feel okay? Do you feel numb? Do you feel tingling? How tight does this feel? And generally speaking, we use the two finger rule where I can slip two fingers under it. It's generally safe. But again, check in with your partner, ensure that it's actually feeling safe. Yes, yes, for sure. And checking with your partner does not mean that it ruins the mood. No, no, no. And if anything, I think it encourages things to feel comfortable and fulfilling and everything because you're not unknowingly putting them at a risk that otherwise you might feel bad about later yes and if you need to feel sexy about it or something whisper it in their ear Mm -hmm. make a sexy gesture it's not one of those things you have to be like hey does this feel okay if if you feel like that's going to ruin the mood then say it in a way deliver it in a way Mm -hmm that excites them yeah it's also remember porn isn't real life because i've seen people that are like they use those swink dildos that are like 24 inches long and they're like can you put that all on my butt and i'm like good sir you do realize that goes into your intestines right (laughs) yeah again we're gonna tell you guys that uh, maybe maybe you're new to porn maybe you're new to the BDSM community, we're going to tell you right now that everything you see in porn is a lie. <laughs> yep. It's all for the angles. It's all for what it looks like, you know, the presentation. And um, I'm going to tell you that most people do not get off during that and they do not experience pleasure most of the time. Now, the kink stuff, a little more pleasure because obviously mm-hmm. it's not like that vanilla stuff. But whenever it comes to just regular fucking, all of that's usually fake. It's all for the angle and how it looks on camera. Mm -hmm. And some of the moans are even edited in. Yep. So, I just ruined your favorite porn for you. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. Find better stuff. (laughs) Yep. So, 
um, whenever you think about, I know, I know that you've had ups and downs with BDSM. So whenever you think about BDSM as a whole, do you think mostly positively or negatively? I would say I think mostly positive. And I think part of that just comes with my own experience and learning as, you know, I've grown up and really experienced everything because obviously my mentality of 19 versus 29 is polar opposite. And I've learned and grown so much throughout the years. And I think because I've more or less been careful about the circles I associate myself with, I think that's really helped matters. Right. Like when I, when I was in college, the local BDSM munch group had this very bizarre rule where if you wanted in the group, everyone in the group had to give you the thumbs up. Now, in theory, I can understand why that's important. However, at the same time, if someone holds a grudge against you for whatever reason, oh, you're out of the group. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely and like high school. It's definitely that kind of elitism mentality or just straight up encouraging potentially dangerous activities that I'm very happy I didn't get involved with. Like on TikTok right now, there's the quote unquote brat wars going on. And for me personally, I'm not comfortable with that oh, because that means... I the brat wars is this whole thing where doms are challenging brats and brats are returning the favor. And oh. for me personally, I'm not very comfortable with that trend because I've seen some doms hide behind it to just be straight up malicious towards brats. Yes. And the problem with that is brats are kind of ostracized right now from the community as it is. I see so many being pushed off different platforms because they don't feel welcome because doms don't understand brats are a very unique brand of submissive and they need a unique handler. <laughs> yes, yes. Not everyone's going to enjoy a brat, but mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that they have less value. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So let's kind of talk about um, any regrets that you may have had since the development, since you started your development in BDSM. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things is the fact that, especially when I was younger, and again, I kind of just blame this on ages, I was more or less quick to react to things I might not have been comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, it, there was kind of more or less an adjustment learning period. And, you know, looking back on that, I see how and why I made the mistakes that I did, how I might have pushed people away that in the long term, I would not have wanted to. So right. I understand. And a lot of that is just being young and dumb in the community. A lot right. of people, I don't think I went through a sub frenzy looking back, but I see how a lot of people do and end up either making the wrong assumption or they end up jumping on something where they say, I don't like this. So I'm going to be very loud about it and end up later saying, ah, I wish I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that's one of those things that if you don't have a mentor going in, it's kind of hard to feel your way for yourself, especially if you <laughs> have people around you that are more experienced and if any of those people that are more experienced like to take advantage of new people in the community, because I have mm -hmm. seen that, unfortunately. Um, now, obviously not everyone is like that. Uh, the majority of the community that I've been exposed to, both in person and online, um, the real community now, not people pretending to be in the community, mm -hmm. um, have been pretty positive, pretty supportive, encouraging, um, I've noticed that the new age of people in the community, they don't have as much information. They're having more risky behavior. They mm -hmm. um, are kind of trying to push everybody else out because they think that they're the only ones that has any kind of value in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one of those things where I don't feel like that's how any of the community should be. I feel like it should be, I guess like a family um, mm -hmm. in a sense. I feel like everybody in the community should be a part of a family. And I feel like it should be a welcoming environment and where you can like be educated. You can practice safely. 
you can openly talk about things, even like hard kinks or things that you don't think you can talk about. And there's not that level of judgment or let me push you out because your kinks don't align with mine. Um, yeah. So I found that a lot of the older communities were more in to the family kind of sense, less so mm -hmm. now. Have you mm -hmm. ever experienced any of that? I would say yes. I think some of the more dangerous ideas that I see from the newer, younger generation of people getting into BDSM and kink is definitely breath play, where they'll like jokingly, you know, share around, oh, choke me harder, daddy. And it's like, do you realize how dangerous this is? Because I don't think you do. And like, especially I see a very heavy prejudice against the communities that have a very strict dynamic play to it like the gore community mm -hmm. and while for me gore isn't for me i'm not a fan of the books and some of the mentality that a lot of it pushed i understand why some people would enjoy that right now it also kind of you know circles back to the whole idea of what is considered what do you enjoy what's consensual etc like my boyfriend he does not like the old guard community because he doesn't like the very strict dynamics with how different bandana colors mean different things. Right. You have to act in this certain way, et cetera. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I get that. Well, uh, the old guard isn't for me, but they do have an important place within BDSM history. Right. Right. I can agree with that. So my very last question for you, and then I'll let you get on with your amazing day. <laughs> My very <laughs> last question for you is going to be, um, if you could talk to someone that is struggling with desire, um, maybe it, it's one of those kind of closet situations where they don't have enough confidence to be open with themselves, let alone with other people. What kind of advice would you give them? Don't be afraid to turn the internet off. And I say that because while there's a very ongoing wave of acceptance and love for LGBT, mental health, kink, BDSM, whatever, at the same time, it is so easy, especially for the younger generations, to get swept up into this radicalization of let's encourage exclusionist ideas and push people out just because we haven't looked at the history we don't understand the importance, et cetera, and understand the fact that your journey is individual. Your journey is not going to look like someone else's journey, and that's okay. So don't be afraid to really sit with yourself, be willing to open and explore journaling, looking at an app that encourages you gently to not be afraid to challenge ideas or preconceived notions. So I think one of the best things you can do is find a, find a good circle of friends you can trust that you feel actually comfortable, open with, discussing things, as well as don't be afraid to really sit with yourself and really try to examine what do you like, what do you not like. And as I know you're aware, there are a million and one BDSM fetish checklists out there where you can just print it out and be like, I am okay with this. I am not. I don't know if I will be or not. And that's a really good way to figure out where you stand. And as you know, there's a million and one, what are you in the BDSM community quizzes online? And you can go through that and see, okay, what, what do I like? What I, what do I not like? Right. Yes. Yes. 100%. Um, I 100% agree with that. I feel like in order to truly do yourself justice, you need to know yourself. Um, so exploring is the only way you're going to be able to do that because someone else can't tell you what you are. You have to find that mm -hmm. out for yourself. That that's, that is your mm -hmm. journey. You can't be like, Oh, well, this person says I'm this. Well, their perception of you is not your perception of you. They could be yep. thinking about somebody else entirely. The point yep. is you have to find out who you are for yourself. Yep. Now, everyone, I want to let you know that you can go ahead and go follow by on let's find it on tiktok right she's on tiktok i'm sorry mm -hmm. they are on tiktok at <laughs> m-o-r-e-n-a-z-i-m-a-a -A -A, two a's yep thank you so much for being such an amazing guest and for all of your amazing insight yeah happy to help out well 
we really appreciate it because we are on the journey for more knowledge and different perceptions. Um, I will see you guys on the next episode of Forbidden Depths. Thank you for joining us and you have a wonderful day. Hey, it's Queen Frostbitten again, your host. I just want to remind you that you can follow us on YouTube at Forbidden Depths. That's F-O-R-B-I-D-D-E-N-D-E-P-T-H-S. Or over on Twitter at the number four, B-I-D-D-E-N-D-P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Remember to always stay educated, consensual, and safe. We'll see you on the next show.